I'm Ushma Neal with the Journal of Clinical Investigation, and I would like to welcome you to another in our series of Conversations with Giants in Medicine. Today we're joined by a true JCI favorite, Dr. Gene Wilson from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical School, as he was the editor-in-chief of the JCI between 1972 and 1977. Dr. Wilson's research has centered on both cholesterol metabolism and steroid hormone action. Wilson's work laid the groundwork for understanding the male-female genital development, and his work on testosterone signaling also led to the first medical therapy for benign prostatic hyperplasia. We look forward to learning more about his wonderful career. Can you tell me a little bit about your path to medical school, where you were raised, and what drove you to want to seek a <coughs> career as a physician? Um, yes and no. I, I really can't remember when I decided to become a physician, but the background behind it is that I grew up in a series of small West Texas towns. My parents were the first, uh, among the first generation in their families to attend college. And they were both teachers. And um, my father had an almost religious belief in education. And um, my sister and I both profited from that. And uh, at any rate, early when I was 11, for Christmas, I was given a giant chemistry set. And chemistry sets in those days were much more fun than they are now, but they were also, not, they were also more dangerous than they are now. And so my mother was afraid I would set the house on fire, and my father built a small laboratory in our backyard to, and where I had marvelous fun with my chemistry set. All, and my, I and my, all of my friends. And so I became early, uh, I became interested in chemistry very early. The other thing was that in one of my elementary school courses, there was a nature appreciation element to it. And so I, um, I set out the goal of making a complete collection of all the wildflowers in Cottle County, Texas. And I uh, pressed them and looked at their scientific names and so forth. It certainly was far from complete when I finished my endeavor, but it was big and thick. And so I was, became interested in nature studies as well as in science as a, a boy. So. It sounds like your interest was more of chemistry and as a naturalist, so what convinced you to go to medical school? I read two books that had a profound influence on me. One was Aerosmith by Sinclair Lewis, which is still the most romantic book ever written about medical research, at least that, that I've ever read. And I was inspired by the vision of doing research to save people's lives, and that I and that, that clearly put the idea of not just of medicine, but of doing something beyond the ordinary in medicine in mind. The second thing was that I read uh, Albert Schweitzer's Out of My Life and Thought, describing his experience as a medical missionary in the Congo. And I came from a very religious family, and I, so I wavered from being a great scientist to being a savior of mankind. <laughs> in the field, and, but it was those two visions that made me decide to go into medicine. How did you land at UT Southwestern, or at the time, what was known as Southwestern Medical School? <clears throat> well, the, because my parents were, had modest circumstances, the choice was a, was a state medical school, because at that time, tuition rates in the state of Texas in medical school was virtually zero. It cost $50 a year to attend a, medical, a state medical school. And the choice was between two medical schools, which was the, the venerable one, UT Galveston, and the, the, the new upstart school, which was Southwestern. And I chose Southwestern because at that time, the uh, chairman of medicine at Southwestern was Tinsley Harrison, who was one of the most uh, famous physicians in America. And he had established a phenomenal training program in this new medical school. 
And so I went attracted, uh, wanting to study under him. And between the time I accepted the uh, appointment in February of 1951 and the start of school that September, he had resigned and gone to the University of Alabama. So I was uh, temporarily in a sort of empty medical school, but, then, but Donald Selden was appointed his successor after a, in a regimen of a year. And he made an even more exciting Department of Medicine. So in the end, I lucked out. Now, one of the other people that we have interviewed in this series is Don Selden. Yes. And he spoke a little bit about arriving at Southwestern Medical School. And it was sort of a, a grouping of ramshackle buildings yes. and uh, with no air conditioning. So he must have made it a pretty special place to learn if you were willing to tough it out in, in uh, anatomy classes with yes. rotting corpses with no no yes. air conditioning in the Dallas heat. Yes. Well, my year, they had to turn out school because the cadavers all froze in a very bad uh, cold spell in the winter. But until they thawed, we couldn't dissect them. But at any rate, um, shack nostalgia is a <laughs> is still alive in Dallas. People look back upon those days as very romantic days. I can only explain it by saying that it was initially an appalling shock to see the physical plant. But after a while, you didn't think about the physical plant. You, you, you just didn't see it. And, and, the, it. and there was a lot of excitement, scientifically and educationally there. And so he, he did a phenomenal job of um, creating an exciting learning environment. And an, ex and an outstanding scientific environment. You spent a little bit of time in his lab? Yes, I did end up in his lab, and it was the, the, I spent the summer of 1954 after my junior year in medical school working in his lab. And it had a pro that experience had a profound impact on my future life. The project that he assigned me was to figure out why it was that adrenalectomized animals die. Hormones had been described 50 years beforehand, and it was, but the focus of endocrinology was measuring hormones, purifying hormones, injecting hormones into animals and people to find out what the effect they had, but nobody knew how they were working. And so he asked me to investigate why it was that adrenalectomized rats die. It was known that they become, rats and people become very acidotic when they, just before they die. So there was a theory that what steroid, what uh, adrenal hormones did was to um, uh, promote this excretion of acid in the urine and prevent death. And what I showed that summer was that if you prevent vascular collapse in the, adrenalectomized rats. They live indefinitely. That's, that is, if you give them enough salt. And so it was not a direct effect on um, acid secretion. It was just the fact that steroid hormones prevented them from going into shock that, uh, that caused them to become acidotic. And so I realized from the reading I did that summer that nothing was known about how hormones act and I thought it would be, now was the time to start investigating how hormones act. So what was your path from there to stumbling upon testosterone as the main focus well, of your lab? Well, um, one thing that happened right after I was in his lab was that um, Selden had regular weekly student conferences. And a patient was presented to him with um, um, pseudohypoparathyroidism. And he knew that pseudohypoparathyroidism had been described 15 years before, and that it was a situation in which um, the hormone was secreted normally, 
by the parathyroid glands, but it couldn't act in the tissues. And consequently, people developed the symptoms of hypoparathyroidism, even though their parathyroid levels were high. There was something wrong with the way the hormone acted. And so I realized that studying hormone resistant states would be a good way to investigate how hormones act at the cellular level. Okay. So now we come to the end of my NI. I, after having medical school and residency program in Dallas, I left for two years to the National Institutes of Health, which was right in the middle, toward the end actually, of the Korean War. And, but there was still a doctor's draft. And I was fortunate enough to serve in the doctor's draft, at the, serve my doctor's draft time at the NIH. And two years later, I accepted an appointment to come back to Dallas, and I needed to write a grant request. And I wrote, I um, read about various hormones, and I discovered that um, in the 1930s, a, an, an early investigator named Kochakian had shown that if you, if you remove the testes of dogs, that the um, excretion of nitrogen goes way up in the urine. And if you inject them with testosterone, the nitrogen is retained in the body. And subsequent investigators had shown that nitrogen is retained in two places. One is in muscle, and the other place is in the male urogenital tract. And so if you take a castrated animal, a male animal, and you inject them with testosterone, you get these local effects and systemic effects. And so I decided that testosterone and the nitrogen retaining effect of testosterone would be a good way to approach hormone action. And I wrote a grant request that was funded. It's thought to be one of the first grant requests ever devoted to hormone action. And um, within a couple of years, I was able to show that yes, um, the reason that, that nitrogen excretion goes up in the castrated state is that, test that, in that protein synthesis goes down. So it was a, it's a synthetic problem. And uh, the, the alternative was that there was increased breakdown of protein. And I showed that there was an increased rate of synthesis of protein in target tissues. And then I showed that the increase in protein synthesis was <coughs> not due to any effect on amino acid metabolism. It was due to an increased RNA synthesis. And, that, um, and you could show that the sequence was you injected the hormone, you got increased RNA synthesis, and then that caused increased protein synthesis. And so the data were very clear cut, <coughs> and we spent uh, many years then exploiting that type of system for investigating the mechanics of how the hormone worked inside the cell. Um, I might say that as an undergraduate at UT Austin in the zoology and chemistry departments, two zoologists had profound impact, effect on what I subsequently did. One of them was a man named Clark Hubbs, who was a comparative uh, biologist. The tradition of studying different species to, to try to figure out how one species works goes back to the time of Aristotle in late, late antiquity. And Clark Hubbs demonstrated that it was still a powerful tool. This is before chemistry or radio amino assays and so forth. And the other one who influenced me was um, C.P. Oliver, the geneticist, who uh, convinced me that genetic studies were a very powerful way to investigate how hormones acted. And so um, with, the, the, with trying to figure out what happened to the hormone inside the nucleus, the androgen inside the nucleus, we found that in target tissues it was converted to dihydrotestosterone, which is a much more active androgen than testosterone itself. And that was a eureka moment because I knew that 
androgen action was necessary during embryogenesis to convert what is fundamentally the default or female anatomy into the male anatomy. And so we hypothesized that um, mutations in 5 alpha reductase would impair male sexual development. And Joe Goldstein, who had been working in Seattle with Arno Motulski, the ge a geneticist, had read about the description of a very rare form of human intersex described in Germany um, called pseudovaginal perineal scrotal hypospadias. And, in, and that phenotype was exactly the phenotype you would predict for 5 alpha reductase deficiency. And lo and behold, it's a very rare disease, but lo and behold, uh, we came across a family in Dallas with that defect and were able to show that um, the muta loss of function mutation in the 5 alpha reductase gene causes genetic males to differentiate and be raised as phenotypic females. So, how many patients are there with defects in 5 alpha reductase, genetic defects in 5 alpha reductase? Well, I don't know. It's, uh, it's much less common than mutations of the androgen receptor, which those mutations are um, more common. I mean, the diseases of the mutations of the androgen receptor are more common because it expresses itself in the hemozygous state. If you're a female, you're XY. I mean, if you're a male, excuse me, you're XY. You only have one X chromosome, and the mutation is on the X chromosome. It expresses itself. Whereas 5-alpha um, reductase deficiency is an autosomal recessive trait, and you have to have two mutant genes before it, it expresses itself. So mutations of the androgen receptor and mutations of 5-alpha reductase gene are probably very similar in their frequency, but the di disorders and the ascertainment of patients is much more common with mutations of the androgen receptor. But you've characterized the bulk of the mutations in 5-alpha reductase? We, you, with, together with David Russell? We um, characterized the first 53 mutations. Then other laboratories around the, around the world began to do, add to this. So it's now, a, um, so very good work on 5 alpha reductase deficiency is now being done in other laboratories around the world. Now, as part of your studies of the action of testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, yes. you studied many different animal species. Yes. How many different animals did you look at? I'd ha I'll have to go back and count them up. I can't a answer. It's, it's more than nine, I think. But the, as I alluded to before, my comparative, anatomy, comparative approach was instilled in me as an undergraduate at UT Austin. But in this case, it was demanded by the following phenomenon. That prostatic hyperplasia, which is a very common disease in aging men and aging dogs, does not occur in any other species. It was claimed originally that it also occurred in the lion but we were never able to confirm it in looking at aged lines with, that, that they in fact had it. So the vast majority of mammalian species do not have prostatic hyperplasia. So it was a logical extension to, from my standpoint to ask why, what is different between the prostates that develop prostatic hyperplasia and those that do not. And a student of mine, Robert Gloyna, who did the first large comparative study, came up with very clear-cut data. And what he showed was that 5-alpha reductase activity is essential in the prostates of all species in order to get a prostate to form during embryogenesis. But in most species, the, the enzyme remains active up until the completion of puberty, and then it disappears from the prostate. There's a down-regulation of the enzyme in the prostate. But in man and dog, there is no downregulation. They continue making dihydrotestosterone for their entire lives. 
And so it was that type of study, comparative study, that led us to uh, come up with very substantive data suggesting that unregulated dihydrotestosterone formation was the key cause of prostatic hyperplasia in and, those two species. And so Merck, among others, started to develop 5-alpha reductase inhibitors like finasteride, which yes. led to the first yes. real medical treatment for BPH. That yes. must have been tremendously rewarding to watch. Well, it was tremendously rewarding to watch. Um, they were only one drug company that, um, that had a project to do this. They, once the data were published, the, they were convinced that, and, and, and the fact that it was reinforced by the fact, I might mention, that was shown originally not by me, but by Julianne Imperata McGinley, that men with 5-alpha reductase deficiency do not develop a prostate. That made it even more, the data even more solid. But several companies set out to develop 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, and I had the brilliant idea of collaborating with a very good organic chemist at the University of Illinois to characterize the active side of the enzyme and design a scientific inhibitor. And all the inhibitors we got were also were weak hormones. They, they inhibited, but they also were weak agonists, and they would not be good for uh, therapeutic purposes. Merck hit the jackpot uh, with finasteride, which had been on their shelves for more than 40 years, but it was thought to be a totally inactive steroid because it has a nitrogen s substitution in the A ring for a carbon. And it turns out that that means that it fits very tightly into the active side of the 5-alpha reductase enzyme and inhibits it. Um, but it was discovered uh, in, in something that was in their stores. Uh, and. Um, and the comp competi competing in uh, drugs now that have been developed by other companies all have the nitrogen substitution in the carbon ring. <laughs> so it was during this time, at sort of the peak of yes. these exciting findings, that you took on the editorship of the JCI. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yes. It was one of the wisest decisions I ever made because, and, and you're right, it was at the, at the peak of my scientific career. Um, but, um, and it was a big responsibility, but for two reasons, it actually aided my research. One is, if, if I accepted it, I got the agreement of the dean at Southwestern Medical School to take me off of all university committees. I was his favorite committee person and was spending a third of my time on university business and not on mine or the lab's business. The second thing is, I stopped traveling. Travel is one of the vices for academic, academicians. And so for five years, I limited my travel to a two-year vacation a year, a two-week vacation a year. And so I traveled less, I was there more, I was not distracted by committee assignments, and I devoted a great deal of exciting time to being at the epicenter of American medical research, and I learned an enormous amount about it. And Do you have any specific memories of dealing with irate authors? Yes, I do. Um, but for every one of those, I have many memories of uh, authors who thanked you for the constructive letter, <laughs> letters that were written. Um, a, few, a, a few people like that, uh, I, I guess, will always be present. But the, um, <clears throat> at the end of my tenure as editor of the JCI, I did a study paid for by the JCI. You may be aware of it. Of, trying to figure out what happened to the papers that we rejected. And it was very the result was very interesting to me. About roughly 10% 10, 10 of them disappeared. They were never submitted again. The authors realized they had made mistakes or not done the right controls or something, and the papers were disappeared. 
90% of the ones we rejected were promptly published by good journals. And, uh, and those papers had good citation rights. They weren't as high as the citation rights of the ones we published, but they were, they were high. And so I decided that the whole function of the uh, reviewing process is not to accept or reject, it's to make good papers better and weak papers good enough to publish. And, and I, we, I rewrote every letter that went out from that office. Uh, to try to emphasize this to authors. And I think it worked. I think, in general, the academic uh, element that we dealt with appreciated the JCI's sincere effort to promote their work. Well, certainly that is our goal still yeah. today. Y yes. Um, I'm not sure how effective the community thinks we are at that now, but that is certainly the goal still. Um, do you have any comment on the way that the, not only the JCI, but the rest of the scientific publishing world has evolved since, uh, since the late 70s? Well, <clears throat> the most striking feature to me is how much bigger it is. The JCI must receive 10 times as many submissions a year as we did, and that makes it infinitely more difficult, the, the number of problem. And I gather that the way you're, my interpretation of the way you're dealing with it now is that a combination of electronic publications, paper publications, mm -hmm. and it, it does in fact compensate for the increased volume to a large extent. And I think that's, looks, it looks to me from, as an outsider as if that's very successful. Now you've also uh, acted as editor of both Harrison's and the Williams textbook yes. on endocrinology, and your biography says that you have a voracious appetite for reading. Um, how do you keep up? Uh, is there a real interest in the written word and in reading and writing? Well, um, <clears throat> I'd like to make a comment about Harrison's textbook of medicine. Selden tried to talk. Selden, who was very enthusiastic about my being editor of the JCI, tried to talk me out of being editor of Harrison's Textbook of Medicine. He pointed out that textbooks are obsolescent, if not obsolete, but there are other ways to learn. He didn't teach from textbooks and didn't use textbooks, what went directly to the literature, and he thought it was a waste of time. And that, uh, and number one, and number two, that I would not like reducing volumes of data to the essence, which is a tough issue, and deciding what was good for students and what could, could be taken out. But just as I was mulling the offer, uh, I was a visiting professor at the Institute of Nutrition in Mexico City. At that time, the Institute of Nutrition was the pr premier internal medicine hospital in Mexico. And I was astonished at the quality of the house staff. They were so good. Their presentations were so good and so scholarly. I couldn't understand it because I knew what medical education was like, in which medical students were just turned loose into these large public hospitals to teach themselves medicine. And so I sat down with groups of people and asked them how they learned medicine. And they said that they carried a Harrison's textbook with them and they went back and forth from the patient to the textbook, and that's how they taught themselves medicine. And of course, what I was seeing was the cream of the crop who rose to, <laughs> rose to the top in this very loose system, but, but the best that came out of it were very good. And I decided that if, if Harrison's textbook of medicine was having that sort of effect in an underdeveloped country, it was worth trying to make as good as possible. And I actually enjoyed the experience, I enjoyed the editorial function of trying to decide what was important for students and not. And I, I enjoyed my experience with Harrison's Textbook of Medicine very much. What did you feel were the most critical components to being a good mentor to trainees? I have, um, I ran a medical scientist training program for more than 15 years and I have a lot of experience 
advising students and fellows. Uh, and I have a reputation for uh, doing this very well among my colleagues who send their problem students to me. But I don't deserve that reputation because what my general approach to, the, to students is to find out what they want to do and try to encourage them to do it and work out pathways that will fulfill what they want to do. And rather than trying to get them to do what I think they should do or somebody else should want, or their parents want them to do or something. And so um, I really don't deserve any reputation for prescience or in dealing with students. That's number one. Number two is that I became convinced when I was with the medical scientist training program that one should never give up, that, some, that the vast majority of student problems have nothing to do with intellect or the scientific issues. They have to do with personal problems, problems of, in, of immaturity, uh, they, and they have to do with, um, with, um, with social interactions with their fiancés and so forth that are not going well. And they have a, a variety of personal problems that need to be supported and they need to be advised on how to get through. But sometimes the most difficult students to, uh, <laughs> to counsel with turn out to be the late bloomers who really are worth all the trouble. And so my second approach was that I never gave up. <laughs> I and functioned a little as a therapist. Yes, yes. I stuck with it. And I think that it worked frequently enough that I considered it paid off. Did you learn any important lessons about mentoring from your own mentors? Yes, I did. Um, I had I had three mentors, Selden, uh, Marvin Sipperstein, a uh, who an MD PhD who had come to our school to run the metabolism unit, and then Sidney Udenfriend at the National Institutes of Health. And each one of them taught me something different. Udenfriend taught me that you can never do enough controls. That you would, he was exhausting because when you thought the paper was finished, he would dream up another control that should be done. Sometimes it went on for weeks or months. But the, the consequence was that it was impressive because he was a man who never made mistakes. And you wanted to be a person who never made mistakes. And I've tried to teach my fellows and trainees about controls. I believe from my experience as editor of the JCI that medical fraud is very rare, that the vast majority of it starts off as mistakes of people who don't do the right controls and don't design their experiments correctly, and then they're trapped into believing what they want to believe. It's not that they, they're conscious crooks, they're just they're sloppy scientists is what the, is, is the major cause of that. And so I've tried to instill that in my fellows. Marvin Sipperstein taught me that if you had a good idea, you should just try it out. The vast majority of them don't work and have to be dropped, but you should always try out every good experiment. And Selden ta taught me that it's critical to choose important problems. And I think that between the three of them, they each taught me something different that stuck with me. Oh. But I'm indebted to them. Would you ever consider doing something other than being an MD? Or did you ever consider doing anything other than pursuing a career in medicine? Yes, I considered, I considered several other alternatives. Um, I think there, there are two types of people in the world. One is pe people like Saul on the road to Damascus who get a specific call and they, their life is focused on that specific call. And there are other people who are not so focused who um, could be do happy doing a lot of other things. 
and I'm in the latter category. I'm basically a happy person. I have a good time wherever I go, and I enjoy a lot of different things in life. And I considered becoming an English teacher, an old-fashioned English teacher, of doing, of doing a broader course in the humanities and American studies. I considered archaeology as a possibility. I, th I thought of a lot of things, and I'm convinced that in medicine, whatever subject you get into, if you get deeply enough into it, it's, it, there's enough interesting things there that it carries its own momentum. And I think that's true of many other aspects of life. So although I'm very happy that I've had a, uh, a career in which 50 years on, I still enjoy getting up and going to work in the morning and thinking about the problems. Uh, and I never, and I'm, gl I'm glad I followed the path I followed. I know myself well enough to know that I could have been happy in a number of other aspects of life. Well, I think I speak for legions of patients and fellow scientists that are delighted you chose this path with the discoveries that you made. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that.